February 7th, my obituary reads, Amber Booth McCoy, Arkansas native, dies at age 34. She is survived by her loving and sexy husband, Davin McCoy, who must now remain a widower for the duration of his life. <laughs> and her wonderful, loving sons, Jaden and Corday. Amber's been a lifetime fighting for diversity, equity, and inclusion. However, repeated exposure to kind and colorblind individuals caused her chronic fear and she got sick and tired of being sick and tired, and she died from unintentional exclusivity. Very often in society, we like to highlight diversity and individuality, but we celebrate conformity and convention. We reinforce the ideals of sameness with ubiquitous sayings like square pegs and round holes, or uh, birds of a feather, peas in a pod, and many, many others, but the thing is, blending in isn't as easy for everyone. And for me, blending in was frustrating and frightening and even fatal. It caused me great fear to operate in a society that loves seeing color in art, in nature, in fashion, and yet I ran into individuals so proud to tell me, I don't see color, I'm colorblind, I just treat everyone equal. I was a black woman in society. And while that wasn't the sum total of who or what I am, I navigated the world as a black woman in society. So for someone to tell me that they didn't see something that was present in my everyday life made me feel disrespected, devalued, and like it erased my existence. I got sick and tired of my identity being placed in a box so small that somehow even the positive labels hurt me. Black girl magic! Black girl magic was meant as a celebratory phrase from black girls to black girls, like a cultural high five that says, okay girl, I see you achieving in spite of. However, black girl magic gave the majority the narrative that my successes or accomplishments were special, that I was different somehow, a unicorn, and that they shouldn't be common among women who look like me. Strong black woman. The strong black woman trope killed me and is killing women who look like me every day, whether in hospitals due to implicit bias or in society because asking for help requires vulnerability. Angry black woman. Angry black woman was a societal straitjacket. It was meant to arrest my emotions and protect white fragility from my passion and often my justified outrage. Very often, <clears throat> I am on Facebook and I recently saw a post that said to be African American is to be African without memories, and American without privileges. And it hit me when I realized what I thought those privileges were. They were as simple as life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In December, my 15-year-old, or excuse me, in December, my youngest turned 14. Oh, my baby boy. And we were planning his uh, birthday party. We we're going to have a hotel slumber party. And he had asked if he and his friends could play Ding Dong Ditch. I don't know if you guys remember that game. It's the one where you knock on the door and run. And in full disclosure, Jaden and I have played this game several times across the nation on AAU basketball trips. So the answer is yes, it was us who knocked on your door and ran. Um, and when we were talking, I had this moment of fear, 
because I realized that even though I still see my six pound, 12 ounce curly headed baby boy at 5'10", society sees a black man and his friends as black men. And then I saw all the headlines. It was black men running in the hallway. Or, as Mel Gibson so eloquently put it, a pack of niggers. And that means alert the authorities. And a conversation with my son about a birthday party ended in the very real thought for me of my son or his friends being hurt or killed at said birthday party. And there's somebody saying, Amber, you're being dramatic. Killed at a birthday party? And I'm saying we should talk to Tamir Rice's mom. The mother of a 12-year-old black boy was murdered in Cleveland, Ohio for playing with a toy gun in a park. And the entire interaction took less than two minutes. Now, as a diversity specialist, my job is this blend of pragmatism and strategy and vision sprinkled with hope. It is convincing businesses that diversity and inclusion is profitable and organizations that it's best practices and leadership that it is wise and necessary. But on a personal level, inclusion felt like a cure for my very preventable death. It was the removal of fear for my black sons, my trans cousin, my Muslim friends, anyone that doesn't blend in. So let me tell you what my life would have looked like after this cure. I got married in 2018. When my husband says, let's have a baby, my first thought would be, you are a fool. Our sons are 14 and 16, right? Unlike now, where the thought terrifies me to my core, because as a black woman, I was more than four times likely to die from maternal-related complications than my white friends. In my life after the cure, when my son says, Mom, can I walk to the store? My biggest fear is that he doesn't have the right amount of money when he gets to the cashier. Unlike now, where my heart beats and I worry until he walks back through the door because I fear he could be followed, attacked, and killed by a neighbor like Trayvon Martin, 17-year-old who was murdered from walking home because he looked suspicious in his own neighborhood. In my life after the cure, when I'm pulled over for speeding, which has happened one too many times according to my insurance, <laughs> I pout about the ticket that I may or may not get and hope that I am cute enough to get out of the ticket. Un like now, where my heart beats fast, and there are probably tears of terror in my eyes, and I'm thinking, did I tell my sons everything? Because there's a picture of Sandra Bland in my mind, a black woman who never made it to her first day of work at a new job because a traffic stop changed her life and ended it two days later. In my life after the cure, State and city leadership give to schools equitably. Unlike now, where my city is once again making national news because resources are being divided among racial lines. And I'm trying to figure out how did we get back to the 1957 Central High Crisis. As a diversity specialist, one question that I was asked a lot, other than, Amber, is it racist if? And the answer is yes, it was always yes. <laughs> is how can I be more inclusive? And intentional inclusivity, in essence, is moving from asking who's at the table to asking who's not at the table that should be at the table and did they get detailed instructions to the location of the table. 
with a chair and a microphone. In practice, it's just culture humility. It is allowing each person to be the owner of their own experience. It's a willingness to self-assess, to fix power imbalances if they exist in spaces they shouldn't. Culture humility is when I share my experience as a black woman, you don't negate my experience by saying I'm playing the race card. Because as with any card game, I can only play what I've been dealt. So, kind and colorblind, well, it killed me, and it's killing millions across the nation and across the world. And unlike other terminal diseases, we have a cure for this one, and it's intentional inclusivity. And because I am the kindest ghost in the world, I'm going to inoculate this room before I go. Are you ready? Yes? Okay. And we don't have the mist available, so we only have the shot. I hope everyone's okay with that. So, first dose. Admit that we aren't perfect. We all have biases. Biases are just preferences or associations that we've made over time. Your favorite color is a bias. That pen that you'll chase your coworker down to get back is a bias, right? If we operate and engage in society, we also have biases when it comes to people, populations, groups, and some of them we don't know we have. There's a script running in the back of our head. But there are tests that you can take online to find out what they are because you can't change the script if you don't know what it is. Second dose, another shot, sorry. Be honest with yourself. What about this group, this population, this person gives me pause or fear? And explore that. It is not necessary when we're talking about cultural humility to be an expert in all things black and brown or religion or LGBT plus. All you really have to decide is if you truly believe that all lives matter. And if you believe that all lives matter, do they matter equally? Three, third dose. Get comfortable with the idea of equity. We didn't get the disparities that we have in education, social justice, healthcare by giving equally and we're not gonna fix them by giving equally. Equity is when we give what is needed to whom it is needed. This looks like preferential treatment or favoritism for groups or populations, but equity is a step in the right direction. Okay, last shot, you ready? Last one. Fourth dose, be accountable. If you hear injustices, sexism, racism, bigotry, anything, and you say nothing, you are complicit. Silence is collusion. One of my favorite quotes says that wherever men and women are persecuted for their race, religion, or political views, that place at that moment must become the center of the universe. The gravity and power of the center of the universe moments. What does it look like? That's when we're at Christmas dinner and Uncle Joe keeps saying those bigoted and racist things and everyone says, oh, he's fine, just leave him alone. No. See, I'm gonna say, Uncle Joe, that's not okay. I don't agree with that. And Uncle Joe may never stop saying what he says, but somebody saw Amber take her center of the universe moment. And it may encourage them to take their center of the universe moment. And Every single center of the universe moment taken is one step towards somebody's life without fear. Every summer, I direct a two-week summer camp for kindergarten through sixth graders. And after two weeks of fun and learning, we go to a splash pad with our water guns and our water balloons. And essentially all that happens is kids and my staff throw water in my face for hours, okay? <laughs> A couple of years ago, I announced the trip, and then afterwards, I had a little second grade black boy come up to me, and he said, Miss Amber, did you already tell the police that we're gonna be at the water park with our water guns? 
And my heart broke because I realized he was seven years old and had already contracted a terminal disease, kind and colorblind. And as much as I appreciate you for attending my funeral today, and I really thought Beyonce would be here, but (laughs) my death was preventable, and his death is preventable. And all you really have to ask yourself is, are you on our list of chronic symptoms? Thank you.